Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and in the ages of ages. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to begin this session <clears throat> um, by saying that I hope that you do not leave from here thinking that Orthodox spirituality, mm, you know, you know, you have the Marthama Church, you have the Catholic Church, you have Hinduism, Buddhism. You know, orthodoxy is just the best flavor, right? Baskin Robbins. How many, how many of you guys have been to Baskin Robbins? How many flavors? How many flavors do they have? 31. 31, right? Okay. So they have all these flavors, and out of the best, somebody says, you know, this flavor is the best, right? And you will try that, right? So if you think that, Orthodoxy is the best flavor, quote unquote, or the best religion, quote unquote, the best spirituality. I mean, it's not that Marthamites are, or the Catholics are, blah, 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 or, you know, uh, Hindus are, blah, 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 or Buddhists are, blah, blah, blah. Orthodoxy just happened to be the best. If you're thinking that is Orthodoxy, you realize that Orthodoxy is not a category that fits along with its flavors, but it's not even ice cream, okay? It's not even the ice cream that you think that belongs as a flavor, okay? It's something beyond that. Now that's what I hope that you get from, from these sessions. So to begin with, I have to mention these two people before I do begin my sessions. Because everything that I know and what I have learned from seminary, from books, from readings, whatever that I'm presenting for the next five sessions, it will be based upon what these two individuals have, have said. And why these two individuals? Basically, when you look at their writings and their teachings, um, they have taken the past 2,000 years of Christianity of who Christ is, what the fathers have taught, and presented to the world today, in the 21st century. Okay, So I'll be quoting Metropolitan Herotheos. He is uh, a, a bishop in the city of the Patkos in Greece, and the late lamented Father John Romanides. So for those who uh, do not know Father John Romanides, he actually is a very close friend of the Indian Orthodox Church, because in the Eastern Orthodox Church, in the Oriental Orthodox Church, you know, there was a, a clash or around in the, the fourth century. Remember Council of Chalcedon? Yes. So that was revisited in the 80s and in the 90s. And from the Indian Orthodox Church, there were two individuals who spearheaded this. That was Paolo Grig Paulus Gregorio Sidemeni. And can somebody tell me which priest was the other person? Father V.C. Samuel from our Indian church. Right. Uh, we're scholars of the... Uh, uh, particularly, um, they spoke about the Council of Chalcedon. And the other group, quote unquote, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the representatives who spearheaded uh, the dialogues between the Eastern Orthodox and Orient Orthodox from the Eastern Orthodox, it was Father John Romanides. If you look at the minutes, you'll see discussions. Paulos, Paul Borghis says this, Romanides says that, and they came to the conclusion that we all belong the same. We're all saying the same thing in two different ways. So in that sense, their teachings are very valuable for the church, okay? So I want to begin by acknowledging these two individuals. I will not be doing justice to the presentation that I do today if I do, if I do not mention these two individuals. So objective of, the, of session one. What is religion and its purpose? What is the human person? Uh, as you saw in the first slide, session one, it says, it says human anatomy, right? I mean, when we think of human anatomy, we all, only think of the body, right? Well, the human anatomy includes the soul that we're going to talk about as well, okay? What is the difference between soul, spirit, and body? What is the noose and why is it important? What are the three spiritual stages of our life? Purification, illumination, deification. I realize that you had the rope session, we had a great dinner, and it's very difficult to concentrate when we are in a full stomach and we're tired, okay? I understand that. We won't be going too theological, just giving you bits and pieces of information so that we can develop what we're speaking in this session in the upcoming sessions, if that's fair, okay? And if you feel that you, you want me to clarify something, please stop me and say, 
That didn't make any sense. Can you repeat that again? That's okay. All right? So these are the objectives for this session. Can anyone recognize this image? What? Batman. Any Batman fans here? Oh, okay, okay. All right. Wh which scene is this? Climbing out of the prison. Okay, so how, how did Batman get into the prison? They put him there. Remember that scene? Yes? So he's in prison and uh, uh, he's put in there. So what happens? What happens to him? What's that? He broke his back. Yes. Okay. So it's difficult for him to climb up. Yes? So what happens? What happens to him? Does he climb up on the first try? What happens? He fails. And then what happens? He fails again. And then what happens? The doctor tells us that he needs to, he needs to be afraid, I guess. He needs to respect the fear. Okay. Okay, to face, to face what he is experiencing. Okay, uh -huh. he says, I'm not afraid, but I'm angry, right? And that's why all the times that he's trying to go up the prison, he's not able to get out. Okay, all right. And then what happens? He, that doctor says that, what does he do? There's a scene specifically that shows that he's doing something before he actually tries climbing up the, the prison. Before the rope. He packs his stuff, right? He packs his stuff together, right? That means, what, is, what does that mean? Not back. He's not coming back. He's not coming back, right? He packs his stuff and he's ready to go and he climbs and makes it up, right? That person is not bad, Batman, just for this session. It's you and I, okay? It's you and I. What I'm presenting you today and these sessions are people who made the climb. Okay, the doctor specifically says, so then make the climb, make the climb. He says that, right? So what I'm presenting you to today and for the other days are those people who made the climb up, saw what they saw and came down and, and told us what they saw. We whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we are in a sense a prison. We are in a prison. This world can be considered as a prison in which there are some rules and regulations we continually follow and because we are stuck in this prison, we think that there is nothing else outside this prison. The prison becomes the world. There's nothing to look forward to. But there happen to be people who made the climb, who saw the light, outside of the cave, came down and told us what they saw. You know who those people are? I heard it. The saints. The saints. Okay? So the saints are those who made the climb, saw what they saw, came down and explained to us what it is. Right? You have something with you or somewhere there. What the saints have saw and have written down that we call the Bible. That's what the, the Bible is. We oftentimes refer to the Bible as what? The Word of God. The, I'm gonna say a scandalous thing. The Bible is not the Word of God, okay? The Bible is not the Word of God. The, the Word of God is not a book. The Word of God is a person. Who is that person? Jesus Christ. If the Word of God is the person, what is the Bible? It is about the Word of God. You, see, you may see the difference? Yes? So the, the Bible is basically all those saints who saw the light, who experienced God, and wrote about who this person is. Jesus Christ is. Make sense? So the Word of God God in the flesh, the Son of God, manifested Himself to the saints, and the saints wrote it down. Wrote it down. That is the Bible. Okay. So the so the Bible is about the Word of God. So we are going to see what this climb is about. So hashtag make the climb. Okay. This is something that I'm going to keep on repeating. Hashtag make the climb. Are we going to make the climb? 
Uh, no. <laughs> Are we going to make the climb? Yes. Yes. Good. Because the saints did it, and the saints said, hey, you can do it too. We can all do it. We can all do it, and I'll show you how. I'll show you the method. Okay? The, don't think that the saints were those, all those who went to seminary and got educated about the Bible, about God and everything, and ended up somehow experiencing God. No. Some of the saints were illiterate. Some of the saints came from poor backgrounds. Some say, saints were former prostitutes, former thieves, former whatever you fill in the blanks, you'll find it in the life of the church. So we can do it too. So can we make the climb? Yes, we can. Good. <laughs> so, yes, we can. Yes. Uh, in Texas? <laughs> I want to go back to your, perhaps your junior year in high school, or possibly college, first year of college, you took a psych course, okay? Um, in your psychology course, I'm pretty sure this topic came up. What is religion? What is religion? How would you define it? By the way, there are no right or wrong answers, so anyone can respond. Your faith. Your faith, okay, your faith. Would you like to speak a few more words about that? What about, what, I mean, how it is religion? Your spiritual beliefs. Your spiritual beliefs. Okay, okay. All right. What is religion? Okay. Spiritual beliefs. Yes. Uh, something that explains why we are here and our plan for the future. Ah, okay. Something that explains our reason why we are here and also the plan for the future. Okay, all right. Okay. It makes sense. Right? It's a rational explanation of the world here and the world to come. Okay, all right. Believe in a divine or an alien being. Ah, okay. So believe in a divine or an alien being. Very good, very good. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Yes, okay. I particularly asked about what you learned in psychology because this was brought up, I'm pretty sure, in your psychology class about a very important person called Freud. Yes? Okay. And what was his proposal about religion? Oh, by the way, before I get to that, any other responses? What is religion? What is your definition of religion? In, in context of what I learned in psychology. Yes, class, yes, please. It's something that people made up to control everyone else. Ah, good. Thank you. Can you repeat that again? Something that people made up yes. to control others. Yes, yes. Something that people made up to control others. Okay. Or to control their own life to a certain degree as well, right? Okay, so is this coming back to us? Yes? So if not, you know, I, I have it right here for you. Uh, what is religion according to modern day psychology? This is what Freud said about what religion is, okay? Don't worry, this is not too complicated. Just a very simple way of explaining this this. Religion is an attempt to get control over the sensory world, okay? in which we are placed by means of wish world, a dream world, fantasy world, which we have developed inside us as a result of biological and psychological necessities, okay? As a parallel to neurosis, a personality disorder, okay? Let me translate this into modern language. Basically, Freud said this, religion, everyone needs it. It's a need, it's a basic need for everyone. Okay, you know why? Well, let me ask you this. Joel Lechon, can you control the weather? Do you have powers to control the weather? You wish, okay, yes. If that was the case, then I would not be stuck in New York. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, Joby, do you have control over the crops uh, and uh, how nature works when it comes to what brings forth in which geographical you know, uh, location? Do you have control? No, okay. So when it comes to nature, when it comes to, um, okay, so do you have control over who becomes rich and who becomes poor in this world? Do you have control over that? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you hope to one day. Yes. So Freud said this, of all the things that we cannot control over, human beings in their mind create gods for those, okay? 
It's out of necessity. So they say, the world, looking at the world, they say, oh my God, my kids are going to starve. There must be some God who gives us food. Let's offer worship to that God. Okay? There must be some God who makes sure that the sun rises in the morning and the sun sets. To that God, let us worship and make him happy or her happy. Okay? So human beings, so what he's saying is it's a neurosis. Because human beings are trying to figure out how this world works. They don't know. They don't have control over it. So to control their life and life situations, they create gods. This is what, this is what Freud is saying. What do you think? Is Jesus Christ a construct of the human mind? Is, it, is, is, he, is he somebody that we created, saints created, out of a need to feel secure? Because fundamentally, what Freud is saying this, we want to feel secure, we want to feel happy, we want to feel comfort, we want to make sure that someone who controls the universe would make sure that I'll find the right mate, that I'll have children, God willing, one day, that I will have all the luxuries in the world, all these things that we want in our life that we don't have control over. Where does Jesus Christ fit in in this picture? Well, that is where Father John Romanides says he's absolutely right. Freud is 100% correct. Religion is a neurobiological disease. Human beings constantly create gods. Okay? Human beings, there's an inner need to create gods. Why? Because fundamentally all human beings want to be what? The H word. Is it an embedded in the very constitution of America? Life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of? We all want to be happy. What does happiness mean? It means to live a normal life, right? So for us, it's not being luxurious. It's just living a normal life. I just want to live a normal life. Okay, uh, just a small house. Just want to have you know uh, enough to sustain myself for the for the year and all that kind of stuff. Even that is our definition of being happy. But this is what he says: quest for happiness is fundamentally the problem of society. And because religion feeds the need for happiness, we all create religions or treat our current religion. To make us feel happy. Did I, who did I lose? Who did I lose? Raise your hand if I lost you. To be honest. Does this make sense? Okay, okay. So this is basically what he is saying. The proposal is this. I want, I don't I have so many things I don't have control over. But I want to have control over that. Right? Because I want to feel happy in this world. I want to make sure that I have luxury, I have education, I have kids that are taken care of, that I, I don't have any health diseases, all those things. So since I don't have control over that, there must be something who are controlling that. So if I end up controlling that person and making him feel happy all the time, I will get what I want. Yes? So you create gods. You create gods and goddesses. Why? To feel happy. While orthodoxy basically teaches, feeling happy is what keeps you in the prison. Okay, and you may be saying, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to feel happy? Is that what Atan is saying? Am I not supposed to feel happy? Is it wrong to feel happy when I'm holding a child? Is it wrong to feel happy when I'm having a good meal? Is that what he's saying? No, 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 no. When life becomes about happiness, the church fathers say, you want to remain in the prison. It's a drug. Happiness is basically a drug. It's, it's, it's a chemical release within the brain. And that keeps you within the religion, within creative religions. So what is the solution to this? So the religions of the world, what, what am I saying? Do all religions believe in the same God according to that definition? Do all religions believe in the same God? No? no? no. Why? What's that? Mormonism doesn't believe in Okay. Mormonism does not believe in, in the Supreme Being. Okay, alright. Alright, what else? What other, what other religions? Hinduism doesn't. There is a tradition, there is an agnostic. Yes, absolutely. 
or an atheistic tradition of that, yes, even in Buddhism as well, yes, okay? Do they fundamentally believe in the same God or same way of belief? Based upon the definition of religion, that is. Yes, they all do. Ah, why? Because they, everybody is looking for the pursuit of happiness. Yes, yes. Good, good point. Because whether you take Mormonism, whether you take Buddhism, you take Hinduism, when you look down fundamentally what they are seeking, what is it they're seeking? Happiness. That's what essentially what they're looking for. They're looking for happiness, right? Even a structure that's given within a religion, it provides them with a sense of happiness because they, they feel that they're fulfilling something in their life, right? So that's where orthodoxy would say, yes, all religions, to a certain degree, they believe it because why? Their religions believe in the same form of a created imaginary God, a construct of the human mind that allows one to experience happiness. So what does that mean? It means basically this, that we're gods that are created out of speculation, right? We begin to, with the, the very moment that you begin to speculate about God, congratulations, you have made a religion, okay? All religions, you take any religion, right? They have come to certain conclusions about God through which organ of their body? Their mind, their brain. Right? And they project their needs onto the God, and that becomes their God. Okay? So there, there's a rational, systematic understanding of how Mormonism works, how Buddhism works, how Hinduism works. And it fundamentally feeds into the social ill of what? Happiness. Okay? So, in that sense, what Romanides say, therefore, Orthodoxy is the cure to religion. Remember the flavors that I spoke to you about, right? The fl Orthodoxy doesn't fit in any of these flavors. It's not even ice cream. It's something else. It's the cure to religion, okay? So let's go back to the prison. Remember the prison that we were stuck in? So there are certain people in that prison who are saying, you know what? I'll tell you what the prison's, what, is, what life is like outside of this prison. And they begin to speculate and begin to imaginary world is created out of their mind and they begin to explain to other prisoners. The world outside is like this, I'll tell you. It's like this, it's like this, it's like this, it's like that. And we create our own religious beliefs in the prison based on that. And you know what they say? And they all create believers and uh, a whole bunch of people will believe in that. But if you ask them, well, did you see that world? Did you see the world outside? No, 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 no. So how do you know? Oh, I just speculated. It must be, that must be the case. But the difference in orthodoxy is that saints who made the climb, saw what the world was like, came down and explained to us what the world is. This claim is not based upon the fact that orthodoxy is a cure to religion, based upon speculation, or it's not a result of philosophy. It's not a philosophical concept. Orthodoxy is not a philosophical, philosophical concept. Because if it was, it would require you that all of you learn philosophy. But keep in mind, saints who are illiterate, who are not educated, were able to see the world outside. Right? Experience God. How did that happen? Hence, the very first thing that we ought to do is to begin by saying, I cannot treat orthodoxy as a religion, okay? I cannot categorize it as any other religion, like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, all those things, because in all other categories will fall short based upon the method of how one experiences God, okay? So this is the premise at which we are encountering orthodoxy. Does this make sense? Okay, yes, no? Let's talk about the human person. So what we're going to talk about is how did these individuals make the climb? Okay. The human person consists fundamentally of body and soul. Okay? So when I said the human anatomy, right, it consists of both body and soul. The soul 
So if I were to ask you, point your soul, what would you do? Point your soul. Point your soul. Yeah. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Where is, is, is the soul uh, concentrated at one particular place in your body? You know? How do you know? You haven't seen it. Yes. Because the soul is immaterial. It's not something you can tangibly hold on to, physically hold on to. But the church fathers say that the soul is penetrated within the whole body, entire body. But the center of our human being, of our human person, the spiritual person, is right here in the heart. Okay? Where do emotions rise? Where do feelings rise? What is the role of the brain in relation to the, the human heart and the human soul? Because the church fathers say, because Plato, you know what Plato said? The seat of the soul is where? According to Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, the philosophers, it's in the head. They said the seat of the soul is in the head. But in Eastern tradition, particularly the Orthodox tradition, the seat of the soul is actually in the human heart, which is connected to the spiritual heart. Okay? So we'll talk about that more. But this is how the church fathers understand the soul and the body. The soul uses the heart as its organ to direct the body. This is Metropolitan Herodias, who said, the soul is the person, he compares it with the person who's riding a horse, okay? Does the horse decide where he goes or where the horse goes, or does the rider? Who decides? The rider. So what happened was, before the fall, right, the soul was directing the body, right? Because the soul was nourished by God. God was the one who nourished the soul, right? The soul got its life and soul was so in one with God, the soul was able to direct the body completely without any problem. But what happened? When we cut ourselves away from God, communion from God, the roles reversed. The body started to directing the soul. Right? Think about it. You're passing by a beautiful bakery. Right? You're driving, right? You're passing by all these pastries, restaurants, good food, all that kind of stuff. Immediately, your body is telling something to you. Yes? Not your soul. The soul says, if you're really listening into the heart, into the soul, the soul would say, ah, no, don't. You know, you know what's going to happen, right? But the body says, no, 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 don't listen to that. I'll be the driver. Right? So, what happens? The soul needs to be directed by, by the body and not vice versa. When we begin to commune with God, when we begin to connect ourselves back to God through purifying our heart, which we'll talk about, then we are able to control the body. The problem is, who controls our human person right now? We're directed by what the body dictates, what we feel, what we experience, right? And fundamentally, what do we all want to experience? Again, in the fallen state, this is what we ought to experience that we want, want to decide in our life. So Romanini says, how do we cure this sickness? There are three stages. The purification of the heart, the illumination of the heart, and glorification theosis. Okay? You don't have to read all this, but this is to show you that there is a step-by-step -step process that allows us to see what the saints saw. Okay? And the first thing that we need to begin is by purifying our heart.